Right, so I'm going to go ahead and open the webinar and folks will start joining and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, I'm super excited to have you all here. Um, we're going to give it just one minute to let folks jump on real quick, and then we'll get started with today's presentation. Um, so we'll give that a minute. I did want to mention that we do have Spanish interpretation available. So if anybody um, would like to tune into the Spanish um, audio channel, you can do so by clicking the interpretation button on the bottom of your screen. Um, it is the globe icon that you'll see down there. Um, buenos días a todos. Gracias por estar aquí. Um, vamos a empezar en un minuto más, pero solo quería mencionar que sí tenemos interpretación al español disponible. Um, si requiere de ese servicio, solo tiene que oprimir en el botón que parece un globo que está al fondo de su pantalla. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, once again, thank you everybody for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Jessica Lovinas. I work with Hispanic Access Foundation as a conservation program associate. Um, and I'm super excited to, to lead us through the presentation today um, of these really great poll results and hear from some really great speakers that have joined us this morning. Um, so I'd like to start with just talking a little bit about um, who is here today? Um, this presentation is done in partnership with the Chesapeake Conservancy, which is a nonprofit organization based in Annapolis, Maryland. Um, they are a team of conservation entrepreneurs that believe that Chesapeake is a national treasure that should be accessible for everyone and a place where wildlife can thrive. They use technology to enhance the pace and quality of conservation, and they help build parks, trails, and public access sites. Um, like I mentioned, I'm here with Hispanic Access Foundation, who is a national nonprofit that establishes bridges of access that provide a path for the development and rise of Latino leaders and elevates their voices in areas in which they are underrepresented. Um, so once again, we're super excited to have you all here. And before jumping into our um, presentation and our, um, our guest speakers, um, I wanted to share a little bit of how the program will run today. Um, so after my introduction, we'll hear from some great guest speakers, including Arce um, <coughs> and uh, Joel Dunn, who are joining us here today, um, and Governor Gardening. Um, and then we will hear the presentation of results, and we'll end with a roundtable discussion um, of the results featuring some wonderful guest speakers. Um, so without further ado, I'd love to introduce Joel Dunn, who is joining us here uh, with the Chesapeake Conservancy. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. And thank you to my mentor and friend, Maite Arce, for your outstanding partnership, um, for being such a great leader in conservation, um, and for inviting the Chesapeake Conservancy to be a part of this exciting research. Uh, so I'm Joel Dunn. I'm the president and CEO of the Chesapeake Conservancy. Our mission is to conserve and restore the natural and cultural resources of the Chesapeake Bay watershed for the enjoyment, education, and inspiration of this and future generations, including my two little daughters, who will probably run in the room right at the wrong spot. <laughs> we, are, um, we serve as catalysts for change, and we advance strong public and private partnerships. And we really develop and use new technology, and we, our goal is to empower environmental stewardship. And one of our most important theories of change that our organization has pursued now for over a decade is that when we expand public access to the Chesapeake Bay and its resources, and when we enhance the connections to the stories of the Chesapeake Bay, its history, its people, its wildlife, the restoration movement as a whole, and when we reach new communities like the Latino communities that call the Chesapeake Bay watershed their home, we can inspire a whole new wave of environmental supporters and conservation stewards. In fact, the next generation of conservation leaders to join in the movement to protect our region's greatest natural resource and national treasure, the Chesapeake Bay. 
Um, the Conservancy pursues this goal in a variety of fronts in partnerships with many other organizations like the Hispanic Access Foundation, the National Park Service, state park agencies, conservation organizations, um, from creating new parks and expanding existing parks to making interpretive materials accessible in other languages other than English, to running programming like our bilingual ranger program that builds connections to Spanish speaking communities at Maryland State Parks. We're working to ensure that the Chesapeake Bay region is a place where all people can enjoy the outdoors, where they can experience the best that the Chesapeake Bay has to offer. And we're working to make this a place where people in nature can thrive for generations to come. The survey results that we're gonna hear about today um, are really compelling evidence that the voters in the Chesapeake Bay region especially those from the Latino community are very strong and enthusiastic supporters of parks, the Chesapeake Bay and all environmental matters generally. We're very fortunate to have a strong panel of community leaders, organization leaders and subject matter experts who are gonna provide their views on the importance of this survey and how we can leverage this research to support our shared conservation efforts. I did wanna just um, give a special thanks to Governor Paris Glenn Denning for joining us this morning. Um, and I'm, but I'm gonna hand it off now to Maite Arce. Maite, um, I'm handing the mantle over to you. Thank you, Joel. Thank you so much. I appreciate our partnership with the Chesapeake Conservancy and, and I greatly appreciate all of you who are here with us today. Uh, welcome. I am Maite Arce. I'm president and CEO of Hispanic Access Foundation. And before we begin uh, to speak about um, the details around the poll, I wanna speak about the so what, why is this poll, why does it matter? Why do these results, um, why are they critical for all of us uh, to, uh, to know? I, for one, was really excited to see that we're, what we're about to show you today. The poll results show that what Hispanic Access Foundation, the Chesapeake Conservancy and other organizations are trying to do with new climate and conservation policy is welcomed by the public and especially so for Latinos. This poll shows that Latinos and other voters in the Chesapeake overwhelmingly support policies like the Biden administration's America, the beautiful initiative to protect 30, percent of US lands, waters, and oceans by 2030, also known as 30 by 30. Latino voters are also supportive of a clean energy transition, which is important during a time when Congress is debating President Biden's Build Back Better initiative and creating new climate and energy policy. This poll tells us that nine out of 10 Latinos support protecting oceans, waters, and wildlife. And protecting land for recreation and heritage sites. To explain what I need also uh, by the important of importance of addressing nature deprivation that communities of color and low income communities face, um, it's important to know that uh, states surveyed in the poll show discrepancies in what we call the nature gap, meaning that some communities are more likely to see destruction of nature around them than others uh, in particular, communities of color and low-income communities and families with children in states that we surveyed, uh, they're more likely to see the green space in their neighborhoods paved over and lost, typically caused by urban sprawl, gray infrastructure, or oil and gas development. And with communities of color also being more likely to be overburdened by sources of pollution, it's a double whammy for, of environmental justice for communities. And one way to mitigate this injustice is by providing, protecting and restoring green spaces and coastal access near these nature deprived communities. Accessible nearby nature is a way to take action on environmental issues like climate change and pollution and bio biodiversity loss, but also public and mental health, economic boosts, energy costs, flood and storm resilience, uh, protecting cultural heritage and history children's education. It's a way to make progress on many of the inequities facing Latino communities and other communities of color. And this is why initiatives like the Chesapeake National Recreation Area 30 by 30 and having protected national monuments and public lands 
Waters and oceans are so important to us. Uh, long story short, Latinos are definitely, we are ready for climate action. We are ready to protect the beautiful landscapes that we're so lucky to have here, inland, coastal, and ocean alike. And we, we all need this now for, uh, we all need decision makers to follow the community's lead because all of us want a greener, beautiful, bluer, beautiful, protected Chesapeake watershed. And Hispanic Access Foundation is, is uh, very passionate about this work. Um, our work establishes access, develops leaders, elevates voices in Latino communities, especially in areas where we are underrepresented. And we're so honored to be here with you and with these incredible partners today um, and looking forward to what we'll learn. Thank you. Thank you, Maita, for that. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to Governor Glamming, who is joining us this morning. Um, thank you, Governor, for being here, and I will toss it over to you. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, Maita, thank you for those uh, wonderful comments as well. I'm going to nominate you to head uh, Smart Growth America or something. You had our message about the stopping sprawl down so well. I'm really, really pleased. Uh, let me say good morning to everyone, and uh, thank you very much to the Hispanic uh, Access Foundation and the Chesapeake Conservancy for inviting me to participate uh, in this morning's events to discuss voters' attitudes and particularly uh, the voters from the Latino community on a variety of environmental issues, including conservation parks at Chesapeake Bay. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here uh, with uh, Maite Arce uh, and Joel Dunn, uh, and thank you for your uh, leadership uh, not just for these two organizations, but leadership uh, that's helped our Chesapeake Bay area uh, and helped so much uh, across the country. Uh, I'm also pleased and inspired to see such strong support of the type that Maite was just discussing uh, in the poll among Latino voters for conservation, clean energy, parks, and measures to improve uh, the health of the environment in the Chesapeake Bay. When I say I'm pleased, uh, to see the strong support. I am, but I'm not surprised. I think a common mistake in many communities is to think that for some reason, other communities, uh, people who may look a little different or speak another language, do not share the same values. Uh, and I would take a different approach. I would say our shared commitment uh, to the Bay, to the environment, to the planet uh, actually brings us together and our shared commitment to equity, fighting climate change, and having a healthier community with shared prosperity also makes us stronger. Now, I come from Maryland, a number of you from different areas, uh, but let me just tell you in terms of background, in addition to being a college professor at the University of Maryland for uh, 27 years, I'm very fortunate to have served in a range of elected positions uh, at the local level and then as governor, uh, for 31 years, and now my 20th year as an advocate uh, for the environment. But I say this as, as background, not just for the biography, but uh, one of the great motivations in my teaching uh, for my service in public office and now as an advocate has been conservation. Uh, conservation, of, I have a belief that uh, our society can develop better. Uh, that we can develop smarter uh, in a way that really benefits communities and lessens the impact on the environment. Now, this motivation goes all the way back to when I was a young uh, college student. And as I look at the panel and our participants, I can tell you this was before any of you were born. Uh, but uh, the truth is people don't wake up uh, one morning or born all of a sudden thinking about the environment, uh, having values in there, including things like conservation. Uh, mine comes from my personal experience, uh, which is true for so many of you and for so many of our uh, fellow citizens. Uh, my personal experience uh, is that I came from a very poor family. Uh, I was fortunate to, to get support to go to Florida State University, uh, which is in Tallahassee, Florida, 500 miles away from where I grew up uh, in the Hialeah area uh, of uh, Dade County. And 
uh, I had uh, no uh, family support, obviously, for college. And so what I would do is whenever there was a long weekend or a holiday, I would drive home that 500 miles in order to work uh, in a machine shop uh, to earn a little bit of money. And what I saw as I finished my undergraduate degrees and graduate degrees was that they kept widening this one road that I would go down, this 500 miles, that was on the edge of the Everglades. And as they widened the road, sprawl developed on both sides, uh, small shopping centers. Uh, today, by the way, that was the, then that was the barrier uh, to the Everglades. Today, sprawl development goes 40 miles out into the Florida Everglades. Now, you, many of you probably heard of the Everglades and know that it is a uh, ecological system, just like the Chesapeake Bay, different uh, fundamentals, but one that is so important. Uh, and we paved a third of that over and South Florida is now uh, facing the consequences of that in water supply and in not having an impact area when hurricanes come and things like that. And as a result of that, uh, my, my, my thinking started to change fairly dramatically. Uh, and I was motivated, motivated by a society, uh, an idea that society could be different, we could still prosper, we could still have growth, we could still have places for our family, uh, but at the same time, uh, protect uh, our environment. Uh, I've uh, dedicated much of my career uh, to what we now call uh, smart growth. When we started this, we, we didn't have the word, but uh, smart growth. And, the idea is that development uh, that uh, features mixed use, like the old fashioned homes above stores and things like this, uh, uh, mixed use, diverse housing, including income mix, uh, transit options, uh, and focuses development in existing communities as opposed to building out and farmlands and forests and things like this, uh, smart growth, uh, stress is something that uh, we seem to have lost in the United States, and that is an emphasis on walkability. Uh, we actually end up on the average Americans take seven trips a day in the car. Kids to school, off to work, go shopping, whatever. Most of those trips could and should be walkable uh, the way they, in fact they have been uh, in our uh, periods in our history. It's a strategy that uh, relies very heavily on community engagement. And that's why I'm pleased to see that this is part of the focus here today. Uh, smart growth has a vision uh, based on the values of equity, uh, shared prosperity, and protecting our planet. Uh, smart growth, of course, is just one strategy uh, to improve our society. But as this survey reflects, we have a considerable number of environmental challenges that we are facing today. Climate change, first and foremost, it's an existential uh, threat to communities here in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, in the nation, and literally uh, billions of people around the world. I ask uh, people that uh, are still what we call climate deniers, just watch the news for one week, any place, and see what's going on in America and in the world in terms of the impact of the climate and realize this is going to get worse, much worse, fairly quickly, and we simply must act. Uh, it's going to take a variety of strategies, not just smart growth, uh, but about investing in a renewable energy, uh, increasing conservation efforts, and getting serious about reducing air and water pollution. Importantly, it's also going to take all of our communities working together. Uh, we need to make sure that all communities are fully engaged and benefit from these investments, including the Latino and Spanish speaking communities. I'm proud to note that Maryland is now the most diverse state on the East Coast. Uh, I'm also very pleased to see that we have a significant Latino population and Spanish speaking population in our state. I should also note that the Maryland State Parks, uh, visitors from Spanish speaking population are now for some of the state parks, the fastest growing users of the parks. Uh, during the peak season, uh, that population represents about 80% of park users at several of Maryland's most popular parks. Uh, in fact, unfortunately, and this is what the Park Commission that I'm sharing is about, 
uh, a number of the very parks where the Hispanic community have been most uh, in attendance are the ones that were closed several times because of overcrowding. Uh, places like uh, Sandy Point uh, and, and uh, Thomas Point, and Quiet Waters. Uh, this powerful evidence that the, this community enjoys the outdoors and cares about the quality of the environment. As I mentioned in, in uh, the introduction, I'm the chair of the new state commission called the State Park Investment Commission. Uh, we're going to consider adding new parks, expanding parks, and also improving the park experience uh, so that many diverse communities that visit Maryland parks feel welcome and can enjoy those special places. Uh, I believe this research that you have discuss, that we discuss here today will certainly help to inform the commission's uh, efforts as we advance our work. And in fact, both of today's sponsoring organizations have been invited uh, to participate. One of the things I'm hoping we take out of uh, this discussion as well is the broader cultural basis for use of park facilities. And when I say that, I've noticed this personally uh, in terms of the frequent use of a couple of parks around here uh, that we find uh, is that the Hispanic, uh, Spanish speaking communities uh, tend to be much more a large family gathering uh, and often with a more extended time. Uh, and this is wonderful. This is what a park should be about. Uh, in in uh, traditional use and uh, for example, it's much more like me, I will take a hike uh, in the park. I must say with pride, I did uh, four and 10 days four different parks in 10 days uh, and was very pleased, but I also observed a lot of a different behavior. Uh, what we should recognize uh, is that the parks are part of the solution to so many challenges that we're facing. I thank you again for including me in this valuable discussion. I look forward to hearing from uh, the panelists, especially about the Chesapeake National Recreation Area proposal, which I've uh, been hearing a little bit about as well uh, and uh, wish uh, everyone well and look forward to working with you as a equal partner. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Governor, for those um, those words and for joining us here today. I'm um, super excited to get into the results. Um, I'm actually going to pass it over now to David Binder, who is joining us um, from David Binder Research, and we'll talk a little bit more about the poll itself, um, including the methodology. Uh, Jessica, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. This is David Binder from David Binder Research. We're a public opinion research firm uh, based in California and Delaware. Uh, and uh, it's an honor to be here today to talk to you about the poll that we conducted. And then I'm going to turn it over to Shana to actually present the results. But let me start by explaining to everyone exactly how we conducted this poll. And you'll see a slide on the screen now that uh, provides the detail. You'll notice that the dates were between July 22nd and 27th of this year, so about six weeks ago. Uh, and what we did is we interviewed voters in uh, three states, including D.C., and the way that we conducted the survey was uh, we asked 150 voters in each of the, each of the three states, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, plus 150 from the district, uh, and uh, conducted the survey with those voters. We additionally uh, conducted an oversample of Latinos. Uh, we, we did an oversample of 150 Latino voters. There were another 28 that occurred from that random look at the 750, and that added up to 178 total Latino voters. So overall, we have a sample size of 750, uh, and a sample size of 178 Latino voters. And just so that you know, our methods these days, we, we do not only call uh, voters on the telephone, we also reach them online and through, uh, through text messaging. Uh, so you'll notice that we did conduct interviews in English and Spanish, both by cell phone and online, which is the best way to make sure that we have a full representation of the voters that we talk to in those states. Uh, and you'll notice that the margin of error is 4.0%, a little higher for Latino sample with a smaller sample size of 8.0%. So thank you all very much. I'm going to be sticking around to answer questions if there are any, but now I'll turn it over to, to Shauna to take us through the results. Thank you, David, for joining us and for talking us through that. Um, we're going to go ahead and dive into the results now, um, starting with 
Some key takeaways um, from the poll itself, including that 84 um, percent of Latino voters support creating a Chesapeake National Recreation Area. Um, the support, this support improves among Latinos after hearing a supporter message. Um, nine in 10 voters, including nine in 10 Latinos, want to invest in environmental protections, even in the midst of economic challenges caused by the pandemic. Um, top rated policy proposals are protecting ocean waters and wildlife and the creation of new national parks and refuges. Latinos overwhelmingly want to see funding to address pollution in lower income areas and to improve access to nature in lower income communities and communities of color. Uh, next top reasons for restoring the Chesapeake Bay are to preserve it for future generations and to protect wildlife. And lastly, majority say that they have access to safe, welcoming, and clean parks, but upper income voters are more likely to give positive ratings to their parks than our lower income voters. Um, so we'll start with results around environmental attitudes, um, and I will note that we'll go through the results um, a little bit quickly so we can get to the discussion and to our lovely guest speakers. Um, so I won't spend too long on each slide, but we'll be happy to um, share some of these results after the presentation. Um, firstly, um, we looked at water pollution and climate change as top environmental concerns or we learned, excuse me, that water pollution and climate change are top environmental concerns. Um, with this data, I do think it's um, important to note that the order of topics of concern looks different for Latinos. Um, Latino voters are more concerned about climate change, pollution and climate impacts than crime, roads and bridges and traffic, um, which we'll see a little bit more of in the next slide. Um, so here is a little bit more of that breakdown of um, what I was mentioning in the previous slide. Um, here we learn that climate change and its effects are um, more of a concern for Latino DC and Maryland voters, like I mentioned. Um, and we can see a little bit more of that breakdown in the chart below. Um, we also learned that a plurality um, of voters see pollution affecting areas with um, greater uh, person of color populations. <clears throat> Specifically, um, we're thinking about parts of the state and of DC with greater populations of people of color um, and looking at how um, they think that pollution affects those areas. Um, so we'll see some pretty interesting numbers there as well. We learned that an overwhelming majority wants to invest in an environmental um, problems um, during challenging times, even in the midst, again, of economic challenges posed by the pandemic. Um, now we'll look a little bit more at policy preferences among voters. Um, strong majorities support several policies to protect and improve the environment. Um, some of those policies include creating new marine sanctuaries to protect ocean waters and wildlife, um, creating new national parks, national monuments, and national wildlife refuges to prote protect historic sites or other areas for recreation, um, setting a goal of conserving 30% of the country's land and waters by the year 2030, directing funding to ensure that lower income communities and communities of color have adequate access to parks and natural areas, um, dedicating funding to address air, water, and water pollution in lower income areas, and lastly, um, gradually transitioning to 100% of the country's energy being produced from clean renewable sources like solar, wind, and hydropower over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, we saw here that nine and 10 Latino voters want to see um, funding to address pollution and access to nature. Um, again, we highlighted the Latino voters here. Um, you can see those ranking pretty high, including 89% of Latino voters um, supporting uh, policy like 30 by 30. Um, we also learned that most favor environmental protections over energy production, um, including a 67% support um, from Latino voters. Nearly half want to be strict want strict limits, excuse me, on new oil and gas development. Um, now we'll look a little bit deeper into Chesapeake Bay and um, the questions concerning the Chesapeake Bay itself. 
Um, we learned that 73% of voters are at least somewhat familiar with the Chesapeake Bay. About half think that the Chesapeake Bay is in fair condition and another 13% say that it is in poor condition. Um, provided with a brief description, 84% um, support creating a Chesapeake National Recreation Area. Um, and we'll see that that support is high across um, a variety of different groups. Uh, supporters also mentioned climate, improving access and the need to protect wildlife and water. <clears throat> we have some really great quotes here from some of the voters. Um, I'll read just a couple because I think they're really interesting to hear um, firsthand from them. Um, so we have a black progressive democratic man, 60 in DC, um, because any type of wildlife needs to be protected and kids and people need to see animals in order to want to protect them. Um, a white conservative NPP woman um, in Virginia, I feel like having the funding would assist in a better natural environment. It would hopefully keep it clean and restored and restore the natural beauty. Um, so I think it's interesting to see uh, the variety of support. <clears throat> Excuse me. Opponents also mention low faith in government. Um, half have heard some or a lot about efforts to restore the Chesapeake Bay. Voters are slightly more likely to say restoration should be a priority of their state or DC than to say federal priority, but each has a solid majority as you can see um, in the comparison here. Um, preserving the Bay for future generations and protecting wildlife um, are both top rated reasons for restoration. And then we'll see that preservation for future generations and protecting wildlife got very high ratings across groups. Um, and including for Latino voters, we'll see that 87% of voters um, are choosing preserve for, for the future as reason to restore the Bay and 91% um, are voting to protect wildlife. And so overall support for Chesapeake National Recreation Area is stable after a supporter message. And then looking a little bit at age, um, younger Latino voters and Latina voters shift towards support after hearing reasons to support conservation efforts. Um, so we'll see that the change in support was um, a positive 9% going from 78 to 87. Um, we also looked at um, voter opinions around access to parks. And we learned that nearly eight in 10 voters see that the health of the Bay um, is as important to them personally. And most voters say they visited the Chesapeake Bay area last year, um, including a 37% who visited three or more times. Four in 10 engaged in more outdoor activities compared to pre-pandemic. And 57% say their access to parks is very convenient. 52% say parks in their area are very safe. And two and three feel very welcome at parks in their area. Um, and we'll see that um, in the breakdown, the numbers are fairly close between different demographics. 30% rate the maintenance and cleanliness of their parks is excellent. Um, and we also looked at political environment a little bit as part of the poll. Um, so we learned that 40%, 47% of voters say their state or DC is headed in the right direction. Um, and again, it seems like some discrepancies between demographics, um, but overall pretty similar. Um, more specifically, six in 10 view Biden favorably and each Maryland state elected has net positive ratings. 
Um, and that brings us through the presentation of the results. Um, so again, I know we went through them kind of quickly, but um, we are um, excited to jump into a panel discussion now with our um, guest speakers today. So I'm excited to transition into that. Um, and I will go ahead and invite our panelists to turn on their cameras again and join us. Um, we will talk through some questions and I will open up each of the questions for everybody to jump in as they would like. Um, so first, after hearing the, the results, um, I'd love to know for my guest speakers, um, what is your first reaction on hearing these poll numbers? Um, and I invite any of our guest speakers to jump in. Maybe Hello, I, good morning. I, I would like, oh, I'm uh, sorry, Governor, go uh, ahead. Go ahead, no, please. Uh, I just should have used my hand up and I apologize for, uh, for that. I'm a terrible teacher, uh, but, uh, and I only say that because of my, uh, years in the classroom. Uh, but uh, I'm actually, uh, I heard the overall results as a preparation for my remarks. I've been looking at some of the details here. Uh, I'm a ver I am very encouraged. Uh, we have some really uh, serious issues uh, facing uh, this country, facing the world. Uh, but uh, high on the list, obviously, is climate change uh, and equity. Uh, and then the health issue, uh, which often involves what's going on in development in the community and access to uh, a outdoor activity. Uh, and what I see in here, and I know these type of sur surveys are, are um, sometimes not as quite precise, but the, the general direction what I see here is uh, the type of support we will need to make the tough decisions. Uh, and I'm pleased to see at the national level and the state and community level some change coming about but we still have a long way to go. Uh, and uh, most importantly uh, on these results, um, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, there's too much of a thought that somehow or other, uh, other communities are not as concerned and as involved and supportive. Uh, and so I urge, just like this panel here, that this information be distributed as uh, much as possible uh, and then more and more participation and involvement uh, from the Spanish-speaking community. Thank you. I I wonder if I could make a quick comment. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, I I am really happy to to hear the results of the inquest out the. Uh, of the survey that you all prepared. Uh, in reality, the, the survey results are a micro, a micro uh, vision of what the rest of our community presents. Uh, for us as Hispanics, nature is central to our faith communities. And so we are constantly engaged uh, with activities that involve nature both in the in the Chesapeake Bay, in the public lands, and, and in the parks. Secondly, it is part of our culture. Uh, we come from countries in Central America and the Caribbean, and even in South America, where most of us spend time uh, looking at the sun and the moon and the lands and the green areas and the rivers for healing both physically and spiritually. So it is natural that we do in kind when we have moved to the United States. Uh, third, thirdly, that uh, from, from my experience of community engagement throughout the area and also in the nation, uh, we have been able to plan psychosocial activities with youth that have uh, arrived in our borders. Uh, and who have moved into at least my area of, uh, of Virginia, and I'm sure into, the, into Maryland as well, uh, that we use the public lands as psychosocial slash therapeutic activities to, uh, to assist that youth and those young families that are arriving in our communities into the greater society. And we are helping them participate in psychosocial 
activities in environments that they know, they understand, and they feel comfortable in. And, and slowly transitioning from the environment to the greater, to the greater livelihood in a community. Uh, fourth is an issue of education. It's, it's hard to learn English. It's hard to sit down in an ESL class and learn 500 words in three months, but it's easy to learn the meaning of tree, of river, of swimming, of cooking, of being with my family, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's the fourth one. And finally, I, I believe that this survey and the whole effort that we're doing of involving the Latino Hispanic community into the conservancy of the Chesapeake Bay is the first step in transformational resiliency uh, on behalf of a better environment and a, an attempt to look at the impact of weather related events in our area. And uh, I fully support your effort. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Joe and Governor for those words. Um, I'd actually um, like to turn it over to one of our attendees, um, Amy, who has a question for the panelists. Um, so Amy, you should be able to speak up now. Amy, you're on mute. Um, okay, Amy, um, just let us know when you are ready and we'd be happy to take your question. Um, in the meantime, we can move on to the next question. Again, I invite any of our panelists to, um, to jump in and answer your question, but I'd like to talk a little bit more about parks and I'm curious on everybody's thoughts on why parks in this area are so important for Latino communities um, and why is this important for coastal access and a healthy ocean? Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Yeah, so I'm James Mitchell um, with uh, National Ocean Protection Coalition, NOPC. Uh, I have a couple of angles to talk about this question. First, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself personally. Um, you know, I moved to the Bay Area with my family in 1988, and I've lived in Maryland, DC, and Virginia. So I'm from this region. Uh, I am Latino. My parents are from Chile. They moved to the US right before a dictator there took power, Pinochet. Uh, they believe in social justice and they appreciate all that nature has to offer. And for those of you who are familiar with Chile, it's an enormous coastline. Uh, and I think my parents naturally sought to bring me in touch with the ocean here in the Chesapeake Bay region. And so I have great memories of body surfing and building sandcastles on the beach. Uh, my parents would always tell me that Atlantic is so much warmer than the Pacific Ocean. Um, and so I have great memories. And today my parents live in right off of Piscataway Park. Uh, and so we visit there all the time um, now with my kids as I'm older. Uh, and so nature is a place for everyone. And we've seen that a lot in the, in the COVID pandemic. Um, I think that, you know, professionally, so NOPC, what we're about, we're a coalition that gathers a superstar team of partners together. And these partners are all finding ways to protect our ocean. And one big way we do this is by working together to create marine protected areas. And so we were thrilled to see in the survey results that there's an overwhelming support for these uh, marine protected areas, um, which just as a translation, they're basically similar to national parks on land, except they're a way to provide a safe home for sea creatures and to keep the ocean healthy. Now, you know, another element we saw from the survey that really stood out at us, uh, you know, from an organizational perspective and as a Latino myself, I was thrilled to see the support for 30 by 30, uh, which is a national and international goal to protect 30% of our land and water uh, by the year 2030. It's an ambitious goal, but we're working towards that. Um, you know, and at NOPC, we believe in 
two parallel goals with ocean protection and MPAs. We believe there should be some MPAs that are off limits to all industrial activities. Basically, this is a way for the ocean to heal, uh, to restore and get that resilience to climate change that Governor Glendening was mentioning earlier. And we also believe that other areas should be designed with people in mind, especially people who simply want to go out on a canoe or catch a couple of fish for dinner, fishing from the pier, uh, who just want to see wildlife, take pictures, just go for a walk, go swimming. And so for these MPAs, access is important. And this is what Maite was discussing earlier, something HAF works obviously a lot on. And this is access for everyone, not just those who have the money who live along the coast or who have reliable private transportation. So another element on access, it's something that a lot of our partners work on, but something I just wanted to touch upon is that when we talk about access, we are talking about this kind of access instead of what we're hearing, some arguments are, oh, from a, a big business that's saying, oh, I need more access to extract enormous amounts of fish, or I need more access to uh, pave the Everglades, as <laughs> Governor Glendening mentioned earlier. Uh, and, and so that's not what we refer, we're referring to with access. We're talking about everyday people having that valuable access uh, to nature. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of my chat, we're a coalition group. Um, we think that protected areas for the benefit of our oceans and wildlife is important. And we begin and believe in access. And we think that we can do both and we should do both. And so those are the comments. Happy to answer any questions on that. Thank you. Um, thank you, James. Um, we have um, Governor Glenn Dunning and Dr. Joe with their hands raised. Um, so Dr. Joe, I think you had your hand raised for a minute and if you'd like to go ahead and comment. No, I, I that was my earlier comment. Okay. I, I'm sorry. Uh, no worries. Thank you. Go ahead, Governor. I was just going to add the one supporting a comment for what uh, uh, James Mitchell uh, said uh, in terms of um, it's not about either or the environment or development growth and so on. Just yesterday morning, I gave uh, through the US Department of State a virtual presentation uh, to uh, leaders on sustainability in 10 Asian countries, which by the way, is quite a challenge, not as easy as organizing here, but it, but it worked. Uh, but uh, in any case, I stress to them that there are too many people say, you're either for the environment or you're for a prosperous uh, economy. Uh, or they say, let's balance it. And you have to be careful of that word balance because that means we'll accept a certain amount of environmental degradation in the interest of having jobs and for our family. Or the other side of it is we'll accept a certain amount of poverty and unemployment in order to protect the environment. I don't like either of those. And I think what we should say is we're going to do both and we're going to do both really well. And I'll use this one last uh, thought here as well. And that is without being partisan in any way, uh, I think it is extraordinarily important that envisioning collectively and organizationally uh, that we all continue to step up in terms of involvement. Uh, these are gonna be some challenging times. Uh, there's tough competition going on of a variety of different uh, approaches. Even as uh, there was discussions, for example, <clears throat> about President Biden's so 30 by 30, uh, we see uh, immense advances going on in pipelines, uh, producing uh, more oil, producing more emissions. Uh, we see in the stimulus bill, more money for new roads that, as opposed to transit uh, or walkable communities and things of this type. So uh, it is really, time for now a, a multicultural step up, multi-generational uh, that says uh, we're proud of who we are and where we are and we're going to do both the economy, inclusive economy, a shared prosperity and the environment. We're gonna do them both really well. And I think that that's what the issue before us. And that's why I'm excited about the results of the poll because it shows uh, an extraordinary potential to do uh, exactly that. 
Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Um, I'd like to move on to another question next about um, the role that Latinos can play in climate and in conservation legislation. Um, I'd love to um, start with you, Abel, and hear your thoughts on that. Sure, thank you for the opportunity. Hello, everybody. My name is Abel Abel Olivo. I'm the executive director for Defensores de la Cuenca. We work to engage Latinos and Spanish speakers in watershed related issues. Um, we do that by creating opportunities for people to have fun experiences uh, in nature uh, to create a, um, um, an interest and in, in to build leaders for, uh, for the future and for now. Um, you know, it, in, in, in context to the work that, that this poll has brought about, you know, Hispanic Access Foundation, Maite and Joel at Chesapeake Conservancy, it's super important to kind of, you know, really put that back in context to, uh, you know, something that we already know, right? Latinos are out there. We're a huge part of, of the, the, the fabric of the society. Um, in, in a recent poll, Garcia is number six in terms of of most popular surname. Number nine is Rodriguez. Number 10 is Martinez. Number 11 is Hernandez. 12 is Lopez. 13 is Gonzalez, right? So we are the future, right? It's now and, and it's just gonna increase. So we need to think about ways to continue to invite the community into the green spaces and to connect with it, as, as Dr. Pruitt said, as Governor Glenn Denning, Mike Day, and Joel all recognize, we all recognize allowing people to connect to these spaces in a way that's most familiar to them, culturally, linguistically, because we're competing for people's time, right? The most precious commodity, time away from family, time away from church, time away from their job. So if we're asking them to come and participate and be part of this, this movement, uh, we need to think about how to take this information and transform it into that engagement, right? So that we can not only create leaders, but create advocates, right? Th which gets to the heart of your question is how do we engage for the future? We know in general that communities of color, Latinos, Spanish speakers live in places, generally speaking, that are high, higher in density, lower tree canopy, uh, higher uh, uh, percentages of impervious surfaces with lower air quality, lower water quality. That speaks to community health, right? So if we're talking about uh, a community, as Dr. Pruitt said, you know, who struggle with, with English and in school, and you layer on top of that asthma and you layer on top of these other, these other conditions that make prog progressing and learning more challenging. People are just gonna give up and say, you know what, I, it's not for me. I'm just gonna get a job. So you're talking about people's long-term educational attainment, long-term financial opportunities directly related to the environment, right? So when we live in these conditions, and we know the impact, the community health impact, the social economic impacts, we become more aware and we become better advocates for ourselves. So engaging, talking about the connections to health, talking about the connections to educational attainment, economic prosperity, well-being really helps to energize people to take action. You know, talk to their local uh, council member, talk to, to their county council, to their state representative and encourage that. It's a lot of um, also, you know, I, I, we don't have this person here, but Ramon Palencia, who does tremendous work with CHISPA, uh, is a tremendous advocate to help guide people through the process. A lot of, 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 of people that, that I work with from the Latino community from Central America, from South America, and Mexico too, um, don't necessarily have that experience in, in engaging the elected officials to the level that we have here. Right, so kind of making sure that that people uh, take that step forward and 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 really call upon our representative government to make change uh, for the better. Thank you, Abel, um, for your thoughts. Um, I do want to be mindful of everyone's time and noting that we have just a couple of minutes left um, in the, the in the discussion and the presentation. 
Um, but I will end with just one final question for um, whoever, whomever would like to answer it. Um, it would be great to hear from a few of you. Uh, so I ask that you keep your comments short. Um, but, um, and feel free to answer this question or just share your final remarks on anything that we've talked about today. But I'd love to know what everyone's big dream goal is for conservation and clim climate equity in the Chesapeake. Um, Dr. Joe, I, I, I see your hands up. I would like to, I would like to be able to have material in Spanish to take, to, to invite advocacy from my community to go and speak to elected officials in our language and share what our cultural values are around conservation. I would like to see English as a second language in public schools, including conservation activities where children are able to take field trips to the parks and to the river and to learn about soil conservation, conservation of our environment. And I would like to see all of us to not only share with the majority community, but sharing with our community through our faith-based and also through the community-based organizations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joe. Um, we've got Reed Perry with his hand up. Hi, all um, jumping in on behalf of Joel and the Conservancy. And thank you again for this great research. Um, showing such strong support for conservation in the Chesapeake Bay among many communities, especially the Latino community. Uh, I think our vision is, is for a Chesapeake Bay watershed where all communities feel like they are, they're welcome and they're, they, they are part of this, uh, this great resource that we have, um, which uh, has such great historical significance and uh, environmental significance and that communities not only understand the impact that they have and that they can have in a positive way, uh, you know, uh, but, but also feel like they're, uh, they're really part of a bigger, a bigger community, a bigger watershed and really applaud efforts, um, like, uh, Defensores de la Cuenca and, and other groups that are working to engage, uh, all these communities. And, and bring them into the movement. So thank you so much. Um, James, I see you with your hand up. Yes, just wanted to add on one quick point that I think a lot of have touched on already, but um, just that staffing for Chesapeake Bay area parks and coastal areas should reflect those who go to these parks. And so we need to really make um, educational materials, uh, signage and everything accessible to the Latino community, both in terms of language and the way the staff people look like, you know, they want to feel like this is a place for them as well and not that they're entering a park that's was designed for other people in mind. So just we want accessibility to encompass that as well. Um, thank you, James. And I know we're reaching the end here. Um, so I'd love to just mention very briefly that we will be sending the slides out after the presentation. Um, so we'd encourage you to stay involved with the poll results and, um, you know, we're available to answer any other questions or um, connect you to any of the great guest speakers that we've had today. Um, so thank you everybody for joining and thank you for our guest speakers for being here. Um, I see that Abel dropped his, his response in the chat and I'd love to just end with reading that, um, so I think it is a great dream for all of us to aspire to. Um, um, so Abel, I'm happy to read it, or if you wanted to mention it really quickly, we'd love to go ahead and close with it. Um, so Abel says that his dream is to see resources, money specifically being placed and invested directly in the Latino community at the community level, engaging and providing support um, organize, to organize, um, to help build capacity and achieve goals in the way that fits their vision. Um, so I just, I love that note and I think it's a great summary to end today. Um, so once again, thank you everybody for being here and um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your week. Um, and uh, again, um, our inboxes, our emails and phones are open to any other questions. Thank you all very much. I enjoyed working with you. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank Muchísimas you. gracias. Muchísimas gracias a todos y todas.